for the last eight years, my sister and I, my sister Christine and I, have been crocheting a coral reef. And we now, in fact, have, it's now become one of the biggest um, science and art projects on the world. In fact, one of the biggest participatory art projects in the world. We've got thousands of people all over the place from London and Sydney to Cape Town and Riga in Latvia have been doing crochet corals too. And it's a lovely project because it emerges from uh, my sister Christine's realization that if you deviated from the pure mathematically perfect hyperbolic structure, which is what Dr. Taimina had worked out how to do, and uh, this, this one for instance is a mathematically pure one, if you deviate and start making the code a bit wonky, they immediately look more natural. And, and that's because nature doesn't feel compelled to be mathematically perfect. There's lots of things in nature that are spherical-like, but there's no such thing as a pure sphere in nature. You know, eggs and sea urchins are a spheroid, but they're not perfect. And so too, there's no such thing as perfect um, hyperbolic structure in nature. Nature loves deviation, mutation. Materials have qualities that introduce their own kinds of aberrancies into the, into the mathematical ideal. So once we started playing around with deviating the code, we began to have these uh, things that really began to look like real coral structures. And we had a bunch of them sitting on our coffee table at the end of 2005. And we thought, oh, they look like a coral reef. And Chrissy uttered the mythical phrase, we could crochet a coral reef. And so we started to do that. And we invited people through our website of the Institute for Figuring. We invited other people to join us in this quixotic project, which was sort of at the intersection of mathematics, handicraft and environmentalism because the, the reason we wanted to do this project was that it was becoming clear at that point the coral reefs all over the world were being wiped out apart from things like pollution and overfishing and over tourism there was this other factor that was really devastating reefs and it was global warming and it began to be clear in about 2005-2006 that if global warming wasn't halted that coral reefs could die out and so we thought that we would do a project that would be a collective community communal project in which people would make their own individual coral structures and we'd put them all together and make a beautiful sort of simulation of a coral reef and we grew up in the state of Queensland in Australia where the Great Barrier Reef is and we joked to ourselves that if the Great Barrier Reef ever died out, <laughs> there'd be something to remember it by. And the appalling thing is that eight years later, scientists are actually starting to talk about the possibility that the Great Barrier Reef might die out, which is just really, really shocking. The problems of CO2, which lead to both uh, global warming and ocean acidification, which is actually particularly damaging to reef organisms are so bad that it's entirely possible the corals will no longer be able to build their bony structures by perhaps as early as 2030. So our project is meant to be a kind of elegant community-based homage to the living wonder of reefs. But one of the things that I didn't expect to happen, which has been really beautiful, is that in many ways, the project mimics the process of reef building themselves. You know, coral, coral organisms are amazing creatures. Um, a, a head of coral is made up of thousands of individual coral polyps, each one, which is it's like a kind of miniature simple jellyfish. They're usually only about that big. And each one has no power on its own, but when hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands of them come together, they actually begin to collectively form a primitive digestive system, a primitive vascular system, a primitive respiratory system. And so they become, as it were, a collective organism with much more structure and they feed each other and they breathe together as an organism. And millions of them, or billions of them, is what forms the beauty of the barrier reef. And I came we've come to realize that this is a metaphor, that our reef is a metaphor for that, that no individual human being could build the crochet coral reef, it's just too much crochet. But hundreds and, 
and we've now got over 7,000 people around the world, have collectively built these massive installations involving tens of thousands of pieces that do evoke the wonder and the beauty of living reefs. They're really powerful pieces because you're immediately aware that you're in the presence of work of many, many hundreds, if not thousands of people. And so the reef project has paralleled the object, the objects, the, the living reefs that it's mimicking. And I think it's become a metaphor for the problem we face. And that is that as individuals, we cannot, as any one of us, solve the problem of global warming. But actually, if we act collectively, we can. And I like to think that the moral of this project is we are all corals now. We can, if we think of ourselves like corals, as collective organisms working together, I believe we can solve the problems of global warming and ocean acidification. But that, to a certain degree, means we have to, as it were, like the corals, give up our individual egos and say, what can we do together? How can we all work together?